Kraft Heinz Company, ticker symbol KHC. Okay, so this for the first time I tried to record this almost took an hour, so we're going to go a little bit faster this time. So Heinz and Kraft, they merged 2015 uh, with the help of Warren Buffett and 3G Capital. They owned Heinz, they got them both together, and they thought they would both, with all of these different brands that they both own, they would do better together. In the beginning, you can see the stock price was going up, went up to $90. Of course, it has been going down for quite some time, sadly. And recently, it went as low as $20. So the question is, is this a great buy now? Is it going to do badly? What's going on? When When is a good buy? So let's look at the revenue. 2014, that's just Kraft. They were doing a little over $10 billion. Heinz comes into the picture. Now they're doing over $25 billion of revenue. That's the amount of money that, you know, f generated from sales. And sadly, it's going down, which is why presumably the stock price kept going down, although we're going to get into that. Now, they mentioned, in fact, you know, when we're talking about revenue, the money coming into the business, so their volume mix went down by 2.4 percentage points. They sell, sold that much less. However, whatever they sold was a little bit more expensive by 0.4 percentage points, some of the things, and so that revenue wasn't hit as hard as the fewer sales were. Right, so the sales went down a lot lower than their revenue because some of the things cost more. Of course, they cost more because they had to pay more for the meat and cheese. And so the company wasn't necessarily making more profit. Now, why did they sell less? Well, they talk about, you know, change in, changes in retail inventory levels. And they also mentioned the fact that they sold fewer meat, cheese, and coffee products. However, they did sell more nuts, condiments, and sauces. So the condiments and sauces are growing, meats, cheese, and coffees seem to be going down. Now, if we look at EMEA, that's Europe, Middle East, and Africa, we can see an interesting thing. Net sales go down by 6.2%. However, some of that is just because the foreign currency, so they have to convert whatever the sales were in whatever currency back into the US dollar for this financial statement even though it may have very little impact because they'll take that money in whatever country they're in and use it to buy more product and uh, reinvest it over there. So there, that money doesn't become less valuable. But when you look at the financial statement, if the U.S. dollar becomes stronger, which we mentioned it might in fact uh, coming with this whole situation that we're in right now, uh, the foreign impact, the foreign currency, is going to be less. It's going to look like you're getting less sales. Also, they sold off some companies, and so obviously you're going to have fewer sales from companies you no longer own. They got cash up front instead. And once again, they have bad volume mix. You know, they have negotiations with retailers, and they have lower shipments. Um, here it's about infant nutrition, but you get a general sense that it's the same idea. They're selling less stuff. Here you have the added problem of foreign currency, of course, but uh, same problem internationally, so that's not a great sign. Now, the cost of goods sold. Now, I found this a little bit interesting. So when you're looking at making that product that you're going to sell, 2014, it was just Kraft, and we saw it was a little bit over $10 billion of revenue. The cost of goods was $8 billion almost. So that's only $2 billion difference. 2019, we saw that it was around $25 billion in revenue, and here it's only $16 billion cost of goods sold. So that's $9 billion difference. That is a big increase with Heinz coming on. And I don't know if that's specifically because to, uh, the sauces like the ketchups are so much cheaper to make. But a very interesting point that the Heinz section seems to be having a better ratio for revenue versus cost of goods. Now, and the earnings call, I also noticed something very interesting. And that is the fact that they focused on this idea that they cut their agents, uh, media agencies in half. And so they're going to have advertisers or consumers, I should say, see 30% more in the coming year, presumably with a similar budget. So that's a great way to do more ad revenue. Another thing they mentioned is they're reducing the number of um, products that they're going to sell with, with each brand. And they're going to go back to 2016 levels, which is good. And We'll see if they go even further. They also have a very strong focus on lowering their debt level to four times as soon as possible. And that's very important, as we'll see. Now, in terms of competition, they mention, once again, this ad revenue. Now, this is not from the earnings call. This is from their 10K. They mention if they want to improve their market position or they're going to have new products, they need more promotion. So once again, 
that's very good. Now, another thing that I noticed was the chief executive officer used to be chief of special global projects marketing. Once again, marketing. And again, chief marketing officer before that. And again, vice president of marketing, North America and vice president of marketing just in general and, and different companies. And so we see the CEO has a focus in marketing. Now, Paul Basilio, uh, he is the CFO. He came um, back. He was there from 2013. He was replaced. Now he's back. Uh, we're going to have to talk about him a little bit more and what his role is. Um, also, another person who's new to the uh, senior management is the U.S. Zone president in his now from 2020 is new and he used to be a Campbell Soup very similar story with um, Campbell Soup you know they were on the decline they turned it around and so hopefully that's a very important person to have at Kraft Heinz now who can really involve himself in turning around the company now they mentioned some acquisitions in their 10k they uh, got Primal Nutrition which is better for you brand um, healthy snacks and presumably primarily condiments and sauces but nevertheless this health focus and they sell in e-commerce and natural channels hopefully with uh, Kraft Heinz they can expand with their reach um, and you know possibly sell in Walmart really grow this company that they bought for 200 million dollars Cerebos I don't know if that's pronounced properly but it is a food and beverage company once again one of these things that I noticed was um, that they had uh, for sale this what they call uh, Asian home gourmet so these sauces so once again another sauce company but it seems like a higher brand company you know you're not just dipping ketchup or condiment not to insult ketchup or anything but this is more for a meal it's more easily a higher brand higher cost type of sale now other acquisitions they mention um, ethical bean coffee company so that seems to be a higher step up than something you might consider as Maxwell House um, that they own already. And Wellio, this is for health uh, meal planning. And so maybe they're just trying to get an idea of what the consumer cares about when they're doing uh, meal planning, or maybe they're going to sell products to them. I'm not sure. But you're kind of seeing this raising of the bar of the brand. And I, th I think that it's not just that they're going to put more media out there. I think they're actually going to upgrade and update the brand so that they're not competing with the cheapest thing out there they're trying to sell a more valuable more health uh, oriented product and uh, at a higher premium so they're not just competing for the cheapest uh, price which we'll see and once again uh, their research and development so that's increasing it's 112 million dollars in the past year compared to uh, 109 and uh, last year and the year before is 93 so almost like a 10 percent increase each year now, they mentioned risks, which is what we were just talking about before. Their principal competitors, other manufacturers of, let's say, sauces or uh, craft dinner. And one thing that they mention here, which is interesting, is retailers. So like Walmart, Costco, they're making their private label products, so like Kirkland products. And I heard Warren Buffett um, in a speech uh, that he mentioned that, you know, one of the things that they uh, had problems with is the competition with these private labels. And so they, you know, when you look at Kirkland as a brand, they are the cheapest but still good value product. And so I think what this company, KHC, is going to do with their brands is trying to be more valuable, more health-oriented, much better than Kirkland. They're not just a cheap product. They're a valuable product. And uh, if they don't do that, they're going to have to sell at lower prices to compete. I think that's something they're going to try and avoid. Now, when it comes to uh, a different risk with these retailers, if there's fewer but they're larger customers and businesses of so Walmart and Costco in the current situation, other businesses kind of drop away, and those are the main uh, retail sellers that Kraft has to go to. So they might try and leverage their position to get cheaper prices and all the rest of it. And of course, once again, Kra um, Costco and these uh, sellers can now uh, more easily make private label products to compete with Kraft and Heinz because they'll have more money, better supply chains. So that is another major risk. And so you're seeing this private label issue come up again and again that they're sold at lower prices. And so they have to deliver higher value or quality to their consumers. So I think that that's you know, where they're going. They're going with better products. They're going to go with advertising to try and change that brand. And the reason they're doing it is not just to fight other manufacturers, but these private labels. You know, Kirkland can't um, do too many things more than were cheap and affordable for the quality. Um, so whether you think Kraft can and Heinz can 
make that brand change or not, I'm not sure. But that is the direction it looks like they're going. And so you have to be on board with that, I think, if you want to invest in this company. If you don't think they can do it, then, you know, it's just not a good idea to invest. Okay, so they mentioned their sales were down 4.9%, uh, but their organic sales was only down 1.7%. What's that mean? Well, once again, unfavorable foreign currency, that's 1.9 percentage points. And then you have selling of businesses, that's 1.3 percentage points. So how much did you really change in terms of your products being sold? That's only 1.7 percentage points. Now, they mention another risk here, and that is the health implications. Once again, you kind of circumvent the problem that people look at ketchup or Kraft Dinner as unhealthy if you improve the brand. A oh, very odd problem that you have with this stock is that 40% of it is owned by the sponsors, which is Berkshire Hathaway and 3G. And, of course, you have this Paul Basilio, the chief of, uh, financial officer. He's a partner at 3G Capital, so they could very easily uh, control pretty much the business, whether through management or the board of directors. So you kind of have to be on board with their direction. 3G classically has this approach of pretty much cost, uh, cutting the budget and cost, um, although maybe that's changing now with the new CEO and they're focusing on advertising, focusing on new uh, businesses and research and development. I don't know. But generally, they have this uh, cost-cutting uh, focus which worked in the beginning, uh, but now the stock has plummeted, so maybe they're changing that. Now, the next problem is that they, once again, they hold um, assets and they earn revenue in other currencies and they have to change the US dollar, um, but that's a financial statement issue, so that, uh, that might not actually, um, once again, really affect the company. It's more when you look at the financial statement, it might be affected by a strong dollar. Now, if we look at the geographic re region, you can see that United States is the main uh, revenue, re the main sell uh, seller. You know, the eight, we're talking about $18 billion almost is coming specifically from the United States. So a stronger dollar won't affect uh, the sales in America, obviously, compared to Canada, right? If Canada, the Canadian dollar goes down substantially compared to the American dollar, so that the, the, those revenues and sales will look like they're shrinking when they're not really. In fact, they could even be growing, but because of the dollar difference. So it's kind of good that, especially we mentioned that the dollar getting stronger in the last video, uh, the American dollar is getting stronger, in the, uh, will not as um, negatively impact Kraft as compared to some other companies like Coke. Now, here's another risk, and that is that due to some financial... Uh, mistakes let's call them seems to be uh, much worse than mistakes they restated uh, three years of earnings problem is can we really trust their earnings anymore and this was really misconduct because of what is called the transaction suppliers and procurement and uh, certain employees were involved and getting into a little bit more details is the fact that the sec now is analyzing their procurement area and how are their accounting policies and procedures working so the sec is looking into that and the SEC is also going to now start looking into what's called their assessment of goodwill and intangible assets. Now, what does that mean? That means, that let's say they bought Kraft for a certain amount of money, $10 billion. But really, it was really, let's say, worth $5 billion. So the company puts on their balance sheet an extra $5 billion of goodwill because of Kraft. Why? Well, the logic is that if they turn around and sold Kraft, even though they only have $5 billion of earnings, but... Because they pay $10 billion, that extra $5 billion of goodwill would also turn around. They could also sell that same company at that moment for $10 billion again. So this is kind of just financial statement. Um, it's not real earnings and things like that. But nevertheless, in 2018, they wrote down goodwill of Kraft and Oscar Mayer and possibly some other brands by $15 billion as a loss on their financial statements. Did they actually lose money? No. But that represents, you know, how valuable are the companies, and it seems like they've lost value in terms of what they bought. Um, and the SEC is looking into it, which is probably the biggest problem from my perspective. And um, the United States Attorney Office is also looking into these matters. They're involved in some class action lawsuits, which are not good. Um, and we're going to have to talk about it. And they might be required to pay judgments on these things. They might have uh, other penalties. They mention 
uh, desist in, uh, desist orders or other equitable remedies. So you know, even if they're not losing money, this could be really bad with the SEC involved uh, on what's going on. And now, uh, even if nothing happens, they mention here, well, at the end of the day, they have to pay lawyers, they have to pay accountants, and so there's a lot of cost that goes on with these SEC investigations and uh, presumably also the lawsuits. So something to keep in mind. Now, what's going on with these three class action lawsuits? Well, there's Headache versus Kraft, there's uh, Iron Workers, there's Timber Hill LLC, and um, now there was this one called Walling versus Kraft. Now, it was voluntarily dismissed without prejudice. That means that he could bring it back to court if he so chooses, just temporarily removing it. Now, elsewhere, I found uh, mention the 10K that the two pla- there were two plaintiffs who voluntarily um, dismissed their lawsuit. I don't know if that's Walling or maybe someone else. But nevertheless, they didn't just dismiss it. They subsequently filed against 3G, and their claim is that the 3G um, shareholders, they owe something to the company, a responsibility, fiduciary responsibility, in fact. And nevertheless, they possibly engaged in insider trading, and they were doing things with non-public information. Uh, the other lawsuits very similar, you know, uh, mentioned by their lawyers, um, this idea that they were misrepresenting, artificially inflating stocks, and yet they sold $1.2 billion when the stock was a lot higher. They wrote off that goodwill. The stock plummeted quite a bit, and it um, seems like they took advantage of things that were going on. One of the other um, law firms uh, goes into a little bit more detail and that they feel that the zero-based budgeting, so that budget cutting uh, that we mentioned before from 3G, that was misrepresented, whether that's good or not. Um, The trends of organic sales, so the fact that they was going down, they misrepresented that. They misrepresented the ability of uh, the company to take new products with growth, which they couldn't. They said Oscar Minecraft cheese would uh, drive quite a bit of a turnaround in the second half of 2018. Of course, we know that impairment charges were because those businesses were not doing well. Um, So that is their lawsuit. Now, what about this SEC investigation we mentioned? Um, So they're trying to avoid problems with accounting in the future um, by putting better control, accounting controls for the contracts. Also, there were specific employees that uh, involved themselves in misconduct and got around these accounting controls. Why did they do that? They were trying to reach financial targets, which means really, and we'll see again a little bit more clearly, this has to do with them trying to reach incentives. So, you know, maybe they get a bonus if they sell a certain amount. And so they were fiddling with the accounting numbers. One of the things that really bothered me, though, is that they mentioned that they didn't maintain sufficient documentation um, to figure out what the appropriate accounting, (laughs) what actually happened, was. Um, So does that mean that they don't have the accounting or they didn't just... uh, maintain it i'm not entirely sure like they got rid of it over time it's unclear to me but that to me is a little scary that they don't know possibly what happened and what's going on so how are they going to fix it exactly nevertheless they mentioned that they're going to involve themselves with personal actions firing people or warnings um that they're and i thought this was actually quite important that they're going to involve professionals you know in terms of counting to be involved with these people who are selling or doing other things with um the numbers and so people might think that what they're doing is okay maybe they're just skewing the numbers a little bit but in fact could be a big problem and the count there will help them understand that the other thing they mentioned is driving uh, challenging but attainable targets these so these ins- incentives are possible and uh, making sure that the indicators that they use uh, make sense um, so someone can't pretty much cheat the indicators and say oh yeah I did gr- better than they actually did um, now if you, we look at some of the net income we can see it's a little bit volatile. That 2018, we can see that the write down of goodwill uh, seriously affected, uh, negatively affected the net income. And same thing with the operating income. You can see a similar uh, thing going on there. And uh, they mentioned what's the main change in income? Well, lower impairment charges. So the previous year, they had almost $16 billion that goodwill, pretty much saying that their company is uh, less valuable. Um, Kraft and Oscar Mayer were less valuable. They wrote wrote that off, and so instead of sixteen billion, it was only two billion, which is not that's not good. That means that it's still going down. Um, they also mentioned that they lost a billion almost uh, from these lower sales, from higher supply uh, supply chain uh, costs, the foreign currency, which we mentioned, corporate costs, um, selling parts of the business, and once again, the EBITDA 
earnings before income tax, depreciation, and amortization. You know, similar problem of lower sales, higher supply, uh, supply chain costs, you know, same idea. Now, in terms of the goodwill, we mentioned that um, unexpected business disruptions could really affect what's going on. So it's not just lower sales, but, uh, you know, everything going on could really affect the goodwill of some of these companies. So we might have further write downs. Now, how do these write downs work? Well, they take say that there's considerable judgment and uh, that's sensitive to changes in their assumptions and estimates and market factors of how well these companies will do. And uh, they could, in fact, uh, decide to write down or impair I suppose, uh, a lot more things going forward if their brands don't do as well. Now, how does this work exactly? I found their 10K some interesting lines that there's significant judgment, right? There's a judgment call when they're figuring out their fair value measurements and uh, the auditor judgment, you know, their subjectivity um, when they're analyzing these things. That subjectivity makes me a little scared that the SEC might be able to really disagree with their view of uh, you know how well, what actually is the goodwill of some of these companies? Did it go down by that much? And how easily can they do that again? Uh, okay, so now another problem that they mention is their credit rating has been pretty much going down. That means it's going to be more expensive if they have to borrow more money in the future, which they will, because when we look at their cash on hand, it's very nice that they have you know over two billion dollars, and uh, they've always been pretty nicely um, you know buffered there. Nevertheless, their total current liabilities, meaning in, in one year, what are they going to have to pay? Well, previously, they have always had to pay more than $7 billion that year in debt. In terms of long-term liabilities, though, it seems to be going down, which is nice. And uh, when you combine all those current, so those shorter liabilities, those things that they borrow and have to pay back that year, uh, you know, and the long-term liabilities, they seem to be going down on a nice trend. In fact, you know, a few years ago, 2016, they had over $60 billion they owed. And now they're up to down to like $50 billion. So in a few years, they've erased $10 billion. And the more they get rid of in terms of what they owe, the easier it's going to be. There's going to be less interest. So that is a really nice positive, right? You can see that there's a lot of cash flow. There's more than $3 billion coming into the company um, on a regular basis. And even though in 2018, there was that write-off where it looked like uh, their goodwill uh, they lost all that money, and they didn't make any revenue that year. That's what it looks like on paper. But nevertheless, when you look at the cash flow part of the paper, how much money came into the company, it was still over $2 billion. So, you know, those are really, to me, very positive signs. And uh, when we look at some of the more uh, the details of that cash flow, well, we can see that they increased some of that because they pretty much didn't allow people to borrow as much money. They required people who were selling their products to pay them uh, sooner. They um, got an extra $1.5 billion because they sold, you know, a cheese company and uh, Heinz India. And uh, they were able to use uh, a lot of that money and they were able to pay with $3.9 billion of their debt instead of the previous year, $3.4 billion. And so that, that really is important um, going forward. Now, when we look at what are their obligations for uh, paying things, so you can see that the next year that they have, I don't know, $3.7 billion uh, going forward. And uh, we can see these long-term liabilities. Next year, it's only $2 billion are coming due. But the year after that, it's going to be up to $5 billion. And so on one hand, they kind of have the cash on hand to, I wouldn't say cover the whole thing, but to do quite a bit of uh, damage on this. But they're going to have to borrow more money, and it's going to be more expensive because of that lower credit rating. So that's a little scary. Now, they did mention that they're uh, thinking of selling Maxwell House, which might bring them $3 billion if they're lucky. And so that might help them. They might be able to pay some of these debts off without borrowing more money. Now, once again, we mentioned this zero budget cutting. Um, so that pretty much they were uh, firing people be <laughs> besides cutting budgets uh, for departments. And so before, when it was just craft in 2014, they had a little bit over 20,000 employees. Heinz comes in. They have over 40,000. And, um, you know, it looks like they cut over a few years 10% of their staff because presumably there were people in both companies that were doing the same job. Now, this will not stop going forward. They talk about combining all these different zones. So Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Latin America, Asian Pacific zones, they're going to call that the international zone. Puerto Rico is going to be added to the United States zone. Um, they've gotten rid of, you know, a thousand positions and, um, 
That restructuring cost costs $108 million, uh, but that's much better than previous years, which is $368 million in 2018 or $118 million in 2017. And uh, we can see that some of the major parts of that cost are um, you know, 123 million or 264 million uh, is specifically going towards a cost of goods sold. Now, how does that factor in? Well, that might just have to be, you know, they have to uh, change their supply chain when they close down a factory or whatever it might be. And um, so at the end of the day, that's not necessarily something that's going to keep happening as they, let's say, shrink these zones and shrink the employees going forward. Now, let's take a bigger kind of view picture of this uh, business, and uh, we can see that the condiments and sauces make up a pretty big portion, a quarter of the sales uh, compared to cheese and dairy, which is the next one, which is only 20%. Um, so when we're looking at their situation right now, um, you know, a lot of restaurants are closed, stadiums are closed, you know, maybe people aren't buying as much ketchup or, uh, you know, whatever it is, mustard um, and sauces. And so that's a little scary going forward. Now, even though there's some positive reports about the fact that they've, um, you know, closed these condiment and sauce factories, which, you know, I think supports this idea that they're just not getting as much demand. Um, nevertheless, they talk about how, you know, some of their craft uh, factories are working overtime, three shifts. And the question is, will that make up for the difference here? So once again, you know, condiment and sauces are a much bigger portion of sales. So cheese and dairy, they're going to have to make up for they're going to have to make up for those losses. And then on top of that, we mentioned before that the cost of goods for the cheese and dairy, it's higher than the condiments and sauces. So that might affect their earnings as well, you know, the profits that they're going to see. Condiments and sauces much be, might be a much more profitable area. So going forward, how do we look at this company? Now, they do have a dividend yield. It's around 6%. It's, but that middle graph here shows that how much are they paying out. They used to pay out $2.50. Now they're dollar sixty. They keep cutting it. They might cut it even more. Um, so I see the dividend as a cherry on top. Once they turn around the company, maybe that's valuable. But right now, uh, it's too crazy to really expect it. Even though they are going forward for now, in terms of the price earnings ratio, it's a little bit um, scary. Why? Well, because at, even at the current uh, stock price, we see on this graph that the price earning ratio is still at twenty. Now, the latest number is it's at 15, uh, the price earning ratio. And that is kind of what we talked about in the first video that I ever published is that's like a hold rating. That's not necessarily a cheap price. And so we have a company that has SEC investigations. It has lawsuits. Um, it has people maybe doing things that are underhanded in the company. Um, you know, it has losing sales. So... You know, it's a, it's a pretty risky investment here, especially at a 15 price earnings ratio. Um, so right now, I, I personally think it's it's just too expensive. And, you know, unless it was extremely cheap and, it, you know, it went down by half the current price and it was, you know, $10 or something like that to, to buy the stock, unless something crazy like that happened, and even if it did, I'm not even sure I would invest. And once again, this is for entertainment purposes only. Um Nevertheless, uh, to me, it's just too risky, this business at the moment. I would like to see some of uh, the, even just the lawsuits and the SEC things to go away. Even if they didn't weren't growing in their sales, I might be willing to take a chance. They're making a lot of money. Um, they're paying off their debt. And as they pay off their debt, that's also a plus. So, you know, going forward, I could see investing in this company. But right now, it's way too expensive, and there's way too much risk. I think that there's other companies that can be found for cheaper and that will just as easily grow. I do think there's a great future for this company. It just I think that the stock price will go down quite a bit further in the long run, even though right now people think people are buying craft and um, you know that might help them pay off their debt quite a bit earlier than expected. But nevertheless, I don't think it's enough going forward.